uh, let me let me second my my colleague's uh, observation that Cuba, because one of the one of the uh, questions that would naturally come up in this area, is that well, can Cuba actually hold three to three point five million new people? Because if they can't, then we're you know that buys you a little bit of time. The fact is, Cuba is chronically chronically showing some of the lowest indicators in the region. The, the only one that's lower is Costa Rica, and I actually think that's a statistical anomaly because Costa Rica has, you know, it's, it's difficult to measure. They have these little hotels and people stay at homes. And so, you know, some Costa Ricans have brought up uh, statistical issues with how that's measured. But consistently, consistently, Cuba shows some of the lowest occupancy rates in the region. They're ready, they're building, they're preparing for this. And I'm gonna show you more evidence of this. So now I'm shading the map, and if you're blue, you're winning from a Cuba US tourism liberalization. And if you're red, you're losing. And the more red you are, the more you lose. I'm sorry. Five minutes. All right. Um, so what we identify, Jamaica does lose net tourists in this projection. Nevertheless, it doesn't lose as many because it has very strong colonial ties with the UK, with Canada. It can bring in that sort of commonwealth population, which is heavily deployed in Cuba right now, right? Not the most, but there is some there, so you can counteract some of that. Uh, countries that really do uh, are projected to lose a lot are, for example, the U.S. Virgin Islands, because they're basically U.S. territory, and they depend, I think, 95 percent, and I'll show that in a minute. Uh, their tourism comes from the U.S., so they, re you know, they're they're at risk. Bahamas as well, yes. And uh, in the Lesser Antilles, and, the, and this goes back to uh, the original point I had, is in the long run, when you start repricing these things, you see these, the, the model predicts, and I don't want to put too much emphasis on it, because when you go to predict the long run, you have to then take into the di di dynamics of, well, how do costs adjust? Maybe Cuban workers aren't as efficient as we think. Maybe uh, this will unchain a bunch of structural adjustments in different countries and really unlock the productivity of the region. So it's hard to predict 10 years out because of so many changes that could happen. But really, the Caribbean is a kaleidoscope. And some of the tourism is untapped. But what this, what this is showing you is, for example, we, we think that Martinique could, could benefit tremendously because all the French would naturally gravitate to Martinique or to Dominican Republic because these are the countries that have succeeded in drawing them if, if Cuba were to open. So what can we do? Wait, you know, what can we do? First of all, there is evidence, and uh, I cite the paper in my, in my paper, people have studied in the tourism industry that culture drives tourism preferences. So if you can uh, sort of play to your cultural links, play to your historical links, you can draw these people. If you're successful, for example, if you're facing a loss, this is like holding stocks, right? You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. So if you think Americans are going to suddenly drop out, maybe you should draw some French, some Italians. You want to draw people whose preferences are orthogonal to them. And what this graph on the left does is it shows you who is the closest in preference to the United States. It's very predictable, Australia and Canada. And who is the furthest, Greece, France, Spain, Belgium, Japan, countries that are successful in drawing these countries. When Americans move into Cuba, they will get these guys. Right, so that 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 this is uh, a result taken from from other tourism studies and applied to this case when when needing to redistribute. The other thing is there are two periods that I studied. One is the 96, 97 Helms Burton period, and the other is the 99, 2000 period, where Clinton uh, administration officials termed it something like family to families. I don't remember what the word is, but they they opened their hand a little bit in in the 99 to 2000 period, and they closed their hand a little bit in the 96 to 97 period. And you know, relative to the fundamental restriction, it's very hard, it's very hard to find in the data uh, you know, a period where Cuba had no restrictions and how did the market react? That doesn't exist. So it's not like we can compare or predict on the basis of that. But with these little changes, what we see is uh, we take Southern Europe, which are people who have preferences different from the United States, Northern Europe, which are people who have preferences similar to the US, and the US, and we look at how Cuba and the most U.S. dependent Caribbean countries react in periods when either the U.S. is tightening or the U.S. is loosening. So for example, when the U.S. is loosening in 99 to 2000, what you would expect is uh, Caribbean countries suddenly move to get the Spanish, the Italian, the Canadians, et cetera. They don't do that. And in fact, it's even worse. In the 96, 97 period, the Caribbean 
is faced with this Helms-Burton Act, which can only, uh, you know, tighten existing policy. This was a period where the, U where the Cuban government had uh, shot down a civilian aircraft and the U.S. had passed Helms-Burton. I mean, these are acts where both sides are sort of moving away from each other. Certainly, the embargo is not going to end. And what, you know, you would think, you, what, what the U.S. is implicitly doing and, and the, what both governments are implicitly doing is increasing the subsidy to the Caribbean, right? You're now either extended in time and so on. And we don't, we find evidence that, you, that the Caribbean actually lowers its dependence on U.S. And the other result that we find is that Cuba actively moves the way theory would predict to ensure its, uh, its both its non-U.S. tourist base and to shore up its overall tourist base when faced with changes in these restrictions. So they, they are, you know, policy active in Cuba. They, they are, and they are successful in drawing, changing the mix of their tourists, you know, depending on, on policy developments, and more than anything, protecting their non-U.S. tourist uh, base. The other result is, uh, so what else can we do? We need, you need to, what, what one would need to do is strengthen their, their macro framework. One of the major costs that are often cited in the Caribbean is hurricanes, but we don't find an even impact in hurricanes. What we look at in the study is how does a country react the year after it was hit by a hurricane in the fall. So if you were hit in September in the hurricanes, in September of 96, we think about how do you react in uh, spring of 97, in the tourist season. There are hurricanes that actually raise tourism, and this is a robust result. I believe me, when I saw this, the first thing I did was say there is a mistake, I, gotta, I have to change it, I can't present this. It's not the case. I can't get it out of the data, so I have to find an explanation. All right. <laughs> and where, what is the explanation that I found? First of all, when you look at international wind code evaluations from the Organization of American States, Cuba and Dominican Republic are state of the art, and they, they criticized and uh, suspended the building codes, the cubic, I believe it's called, in, in the region, in the, in the English-speaking region. The second explanation I found, uh, and, that, and, and that, that evaluation was actually driven by performance, the poor performance of hurricanes, of, of uh, building codes during hurricanes. Secondly, I found evidence, and there's a very good paper cited in my paper, that uh, natural disasters bring forth refurbishments increase multilateral lending, like uh, Caribbean Risk Insurance Facility, s increase remittances, and always when these things occur, whether domestic or, ex or external financing, tourism is a priority sector. So you, you could almost uh, consider, you know, the, the flexibility that you have to absorb external financing and implement it in an efficient way helps you tremendously if, if you're hit by one of these storms, and that's why the macro framework and the investment uh, framework in your country should be strong. 